I really feel like God wants to set people free from some mindsets this morning. <laughs> we're going to talk about faith. Um, we're going to talk about faith and what faith really is. Um, let me pray. Jesus, <laughs> we know that faith is one of the key, most important parts of our life, our journey. And so, Lord, we, we have so many questions about what faith is and so many struggles and, and things we've been taught. We just ask for real simplicity this morning. I just ask for, for things to click this morning. I ask for um, uh, your Holy Spirit to just flow through our dialogue together, through your word right now. And I just pray that you would really just breathe fresh uh, life into people about their own personal faith. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, I ask this. Amen. Okay. Um, so, we, uh, we all know that faith is absolutely vital for, um, for our lives, right? The great uh, faith chapter of Hebrews talks about all the people, the greats who walked in faith over the centuries, over the millennia and how God blessed them. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know that it's by faith that we inherit the promises, and faith and patience. We know a lot about the patience. We're going to focus on the faith part. Um, but what is faith, you know? Like, we hear teachings on it all the time, and uh, a lot of them are very varied and mixed, and we get different interpretations of it. And um what I want to present to you this morning, and we've talked about this in previous uh, months, um, but what I, what I want to present to you is that faith has little to do with you and all to do with God. That faith does not ha really does not have as much to do with your ability to muster it up and believe it and to gain some kind of plateau in that it's like this ladder that you climb, this faith thing that you get to different levels at, that actually faith is much different. It, faith is actually much simpler and easier, and this is why there's going to be some radical freedom as we get this message, because many of us are tired of climbing that ladder. We've been told through countless sermons over the years, over the decades, about Believing God for things and claiming things and, and, and holding to things and, and, and standing firm on the promises and believing against all hope. All this stuff, all good stuff in scripture, I, I get it. But so much of it has been about us. It's about our ability to believe, our um, steps forward to trust. And I'm telling you, and if anybody here is honest enough with themselves and any Christian out there is honest enough with themselves, it often leaves us disappointed because we try so hard to believe, we try for the promises, and so often we don't experience them. And we end up beating ourselves up as a result. And we end up saying like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Do I need to confess it more? Do I need to think it more? Do I need to, what, what does that mean? Do I have it in my heart? Do I, okay, all that stuff is, is good. You know, confession, we've talked about that before. Uh, we all know about these principles, most of us. Um, I really want to simplify it. I really want to simplify it for us. That faith really has little to do with your effort to conjure it up and get to a certain place of believing, and it has all to do with what God already believes. It's his faith. The reason we get mixed up over this issue and why we have tons and tons of self-focused teachings in the church over the centuries is that we have some misinterpretations of the Greek in our English Bibles. We have a lot of verses in the Bible where we read, for example, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So Paul says that I live by faith in Jesus. Well, that's not really what he was originally saying in his language. The translators over the years have substituted a very important Greek word, of, and replaced it with in. What Paul really said 
and the King James is one of the few translations that keep it this way. What he really said is that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of God. So Christ, in the NIV, it says that Christ says the disciples have faith in God. In the King James Version and in the original Greek, he actually says, have the faith of God in yourselves. The word of and the word in, there's a huge difference there. Because what Paul is saying is that he lives by God's faith. He lives by what God believes to be true. He doesn't live by his own. <laughs> Shabba, thank you, Lord. He doesn't live by his own faith. Faith in God has to do with your faith, your ability to trust. And this is what we talk about. We talk about faith. Well, it's like, okay, I, it means believing that everything is going to work out for the good. Well, again, that makes it all about you, your ability to believe that all things are going to work out for the good. The faith of God is very different. The faith of God is what he believes. And he believes that everything is going to work out for the good, whether you get it or not. <laughs> whether you believe it or not, whether you apprehend it or not, God believes it. And there is a lot of freedom when we get this. So... Let me just break this down a little bit. And we'll use Galatians 2.20 because that's such a perfect thing. And we'll go right to the next chapter, Galatians 3. And instead of, I'm going to read from English translations, but I'm going to substitute it with what the original Greek says. And even in my English translations, it does give a little notation and says, well, on the bottom, this is what it actually says. <laughs> this is what it literally means. It means of, not in. So Paul says in... Uh, in, the next, in a few verses down, he says to the Galatians 3.2, he says, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, the NIV says, Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? It's not what he originally wrote there. He wrote, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith. He repeats himself a little bit down in verse 5. Did you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Therefore, verse 7, be sure that it is, it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. He goes down, for as many are, uh, of the works of the law are under a curse. So he talks about two different types of people. He talks about those who are of the law and those who are of the faith. Again, the faith is the message of what God declares to be true. It's true. It's just simple truth. Again, whether you believe it or experience it or not, it's the truth. It's God's faith. It's a message. That's why if you go down even further in Galatians 3, a lot of tra there's one translation in particular that it actually capitalizes faith with a capital F because it, it's basically saying that Jesus is faith. Jesus is faith. So in verse 23, it says, but before faith came, or you could say before Jesus came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. The faith has to do with a person. It has to do with God. It has to do with a message of truth. That's what that word faith is talking about there. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Or now that Jesus has come, now that the truth has come, you don't have to live under the law anymore because the truth is, the message of faith is, that you are free, that your sins are washed away, that Jesus has taken away all evil, all of the guilt, all of the condemnation. He's done it. That is the message of faith. Let me pause for a moment. Any questions or comments or confusion or things that this raises? Any feedback of any kind before we continue with this? It takes, the, it takes the weight off. It takes the, for, like you say, frees you up. Because yeah. You don't have to, like, muster it up. You don't have mm -hmm. to, like... Yeah. Even if you don't have... I mean, you don't have... You have God's. Yeah. God has it of you. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I, I heard this concept before one time that I was at a place that um, somebody was praying for another person and the guy said that it wasn't his faith and I 
got really, I got really confused. Yeah, yeah. The guy said, it's not my faith. And I'm like, really? Mm. And so, so it is God. It's God's faith. It's His faith. Yeah. Yeah. It is different. And it does take, you know me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a revelation. It's, because if it's your faith, then there's this long journey, this long process you need to get to to actually believe these wild things that the Bible tells us. But if it's God's faith, it's already true. It's just there. It's just a revelation. This is what God believes. This is it. This is truth. That's it. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I just felt um, like it was like um, it was like an instant freedom. Like when you said that, like of faith instead of in faith. Because it's like God believes it whether or not you do. And it's kind of like I just, um, I just watched Charlotte's Web. And it's like, you know, Charlotte always believed in Wilbur. Despite of anything that he believed in himself, she always knew that he was meant for greatness. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like that. Yeah. And it's like, what? That's why these themes keep showing up in our literature that and like finding yourself because God so wrote it into us and we're so desperate for it mm. that it's showing up in all these places. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I heard um, an analogy once that, um, just on that, that understanding of it's God's faith, not ours, is that like, you know, a little kid being on uh, on his dad's shoulder, you know, his security that he's up in the air is not by his own works, but it's by knowing that his dad has him. Mm. So it's like, okay, dad, do you have me? He's, the, the dad, the dad's secure that he has him, and the kid's going to be relaxed and free because he's trusting on the security of his father holding him up not his own security yeah, to maintain himself in the air. Yeah. So the faith is not the faith of him being in the air, but the faith of his dad holding him. And if the dad says he has him, he has then him. he has him. Wow. So it's not his faith, but it's that. So that's cool. That's that's really, cool. that's really good, and it's cool because I was praying for a simple analogy to explain it, and I couldn't get it. I couldn't figure out something like <laughs> simple. So the Lord provided it to you. Such a time. As um, as but as that as really gives. Yeah, <laughs> that really gives a good. Hold on one second. That gives a really good picture for me too because it's I kind of see like masses of Christians on their dad's shoulder mm -hmm. and so many of them are freaking out and they're trying to hold on tight and they're mm -hmm. trying to believe that he's there and like they're getting all stressed out and anxious and tight and you know what stress does to your body right mm -hmm. Tenses it up. yeah it makes you sick and believes all kinds of crap mm -hmm. so you're stressed out so you're really on God all along <laughs> he's the one holding you but you you've been told that okay it's all about you holding on to God so you're trying to get that hold on to God but in reality He's already holding on to you. I like that a lot. That's good. Yeah. Why do um, why do the uh, English translators uh, translate these things the way that they do? Because it makes it very confusing when you hear scriptures like um, "Without faith, it's impossible to please Him." Yeah. Or "Ye of little faith." Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. And it, it makes it seem like it has to come from, from yeah. you, and you have to show that faith to God and prove it to God or something. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah. Was there ever an explanation for why they... Um, why they did it? I, you know, I think there's good intentions and bad intentions in every stupid mistake we've made in the church and, and in Bible translation. The good intention is that they honestly believe that that's what the of word represented and they're just trying to put it into modern English. So the faith of God means, you know, faith in God. They're just interpreting it a little wrong. I think the bad intentions is that we and the Bible translators included have made it, we're, we're so self-focused and we're all about our own works. We're all about our own ability to get into salvation. So even the word saved by faith, you know, through grace, we've made that about our faith, our ability to believe, but it's really, we're saved by the faith of Christ. We're saved by, he did the saving, it's done. <laughs> That's why it's by grace and not by works so that no one can boast. But if you make it about your faith, then you could still boast that you believed, that you did something to get that salvation. You believed. But there is no boasting before God. It is what Jesus believes. It's sheer grace. And, um, and we don't believe that. We don't. So we, we rewrite the scriptures according to our own unbelief. That's, what, that's uh, unfortunately what we do. I know that sounds major conspiracy theory-ish, but I mean, look at church history and that backs it up. So much of the fruit of it. When... Um, when you just look at what people have done in holding the Bible away from the masses over the centuries, and and um, yeah, so does that answer your question a little bit? 
Okay. So let me show you something beautiful about this in Second Peter, in his words to um, to the Christians. Probably, I don't know, it doesn't say who he was writing to, if it's the same people that he was writing to in his first letter. It was like the region of Asia Minor, Galatia, you know, modern-day Greece and all those areas. He was writing to a bunch of people, just like us, all right, <laughs> Christians. Church is the people that have discovered the message of Jesus. And um, again, I'm going to read this from a bunch of translations and kind of point out what the original Greek was getting at. Second Peter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, the opening statement, the opening verse. Okay. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so the King James Version says, to them who have, who have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, to go back again to the New American Standard, let me read it over one more time. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. That word kind, and there's even a little notation in my Bible over the word kind, that word kind actually means value. The word value. So, to those who have received a faith of the same value as ours, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is telling these Christians in that area that they had received simply this faith that was of the same value as his. That their faith was on the same footing as his faith. Now this is beautiful because we would think that Mr. Mighty Apostle Peter, he would have a higher value in his faith level. I mean, the guy's shadow healed people. Really, he'd walk around and his shadow would heal people. Book of Acts. He did mighty exploits. He trusted God enough for him to be crucified upside down ultimately in his life. I mean, this was a serious dude. And he was saying to the people that he's writing to that they had received a faith of the same value as his. Meaning this, that faith is the same for every single person. It's simply receiving a message of truth. It's God's faith. It's just reality. And so we all have the same level of faith. <laughs> we all, even if you don't feel it or understand it, we all have the same level of faith because what faith really is, is a message of truth that's true for you, as true as it is for Tom Earl, as true as it is for the Apostle Peter, everybody else. Yeah. Isn't there a scripture that says, quote, the measure of faith? And not a measure of faith, which means there's only one measure of That's faith. good. I, I, I know the scripture you're talking yeah, no, about. I yeah, I know the one you're talking about. But everyone has received, you could say, a measure, or maybe it says the measure. It says the measure. I think it does in the King James. And, and which kind of indicates that there are not different measures. There's only one measure of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly Yeah. Saying. Romans 12, verse 3 says, By the grace given to me... I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment, which, by the way, means soberly awaken to the truth of who you really are. <laughs> think of yourself in sober judgment, because he's talking about equality in the church. So we're all equal in Christ. This is the truth of Christ. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. That's in Romans 12. You're right. I never knew that. Soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, King James says. Hmm. Every man the measure of faith. So we all have it. We all have the same value of faith. Again, this lifts the burden off of our shoulders, right? This, this takes it into a totally new realm of understanding. that This is just true. It's just the truth. It's a message that we can just say yes to. Even if we have a hard time agreeing with it or understanding it or apprehending it, that doesn't matter because the truth is the truth. It's, it's, it's settled. And that's why he said that all we need is the faith of a mustard seed. Thank you. Beautiful. Perfect. Some people would interpret that passage of Scripture. I used to interpret it this way. When Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. 
So I would use, I used to think, well, that must mean that I have faith like a breadcrumb. Mm-hmm. Not a breadcrumb. I have faith like a cell. Mm-hmm. And maybe one day I can work that up to a mustard seed. And then I could start moving mountains in my life. That's not the point of his hyperbole there and his method of teaching. Nothing to do with that. He's basically saying that you could have your, your it doesn't matter how big or small your faith is. Has nothing to do with that. Just have the faith of God. Just realize it. And you can move mountains. <laughs> yeah, I think that's exactly what he's getting at there. I read something amazing. Yeah, here it is. Wait, wait, let, me, let me backtrack. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, clarification. So uh, our faith is in the faith of God. So if there were any type of um, thing that we needed to muster up, it would have to be the value of a mustard seed to move that mountain. Is that what you're, that what you're saying? No, I'm, I'm saying... It's so it's rooted in Christ. Yeah, well, kind of. I'm saying that size <clears throat> of faith is irrelevant. It has okay, nothing to do with size. Okay. It's just faith is true for every single person. Faith is faith. Everybody's been given that same measure of faith. It's just the truth. And so everyone can move mountains. I think that's what he's getting at there. He's like trying to hit him over the head to say, don't you realize <laughs> this reality? It's, it, this is true for everyone. This is just truth. So it doesn't matter what your level of faith is. It's just every single person can move mountains. That, that, I think that's more of what I'm trying to explain there, that it's just the truth. Nick, then that means it's just an interpretation of the word. Because there's a lot more that you need than faith in order to really follow God. Because there are people that believe that God exists, so that gives them faith because they understand the truth. But they're not followers. Mm-hmm. They're not, you know, you wouldn't say that they're saved if they're going to heaven. Right? I think that's a totally different subject than what I'm getting at here. I, I know what you mean in understanding like our personal relationship with the Lord and that's more on the love end of things like because the Bible talks about faith hope and love repeatedly we all know first Corinthians 13 about the greatest of these is you know love faith hope and love will remain forever I think that's more on the love end of things that there's a love journey there's there's different degrees of love which really also is the same in the sense that you simply realize how much God loves you. It has little to do with your love, but as you realize God's love for you, you grow in love naturally. So I would say people that say they believe in God but go on living like, you know, even, (laughs) they don't really know. They don't really believe. They don't really know the full message of faith. They don't really know the full reality of God's love for them. But again, I would say that's more of a love issue, right? Because Jesus Jesus talks about those who... You know, those who I know, those who love, those who have loved His appearing, those will, you know, be welcomed into His kingdom. That that whole thing, faith. I'm talking about just the faith of God. Different kind of issue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the Bible says to meditate on Thy Word. <laughs> I would meditate. I'll give you the scripture after where this is it's in the Psalms but just meditate on this for a moment forever O Lord your word is settled in heaven your faithfulness continues throughout all generations you established the earth and it stands you don't have to pull the earth up and keep it in space God established the earth and it stands he established your righteousness in Christ and it stands he established your authority in Christ and it stands he established your forgiveness your peace and it stands your word is settled I like that in heaven your faithfulness continues throughout all generations again it's about God's faith or his faithfulness and tapping into that you establish the earth and it stands that's from Psalm 119 89 and 90. I really believe that every person that has really tapped into the miraculous power of God, first of all, it's a gift. They don't teach that a lot of times. These guys, they they write books and and sell lots of books about keys and techniques to get their level of anointing. (laughs) But um, 
but in the end, I think it's really all a gift, first of all. And a lot of these guys that move in crazy miracles, I, I, I really believe they've been given a gift of revelation in realizing that it's all Jesus, that, that he's there, it's his authority and power. And when they pray over people, they have this revelation, this understanding that Jesus is right there, and he's healed them, and his, he's got healing power, and he wants to heal them, and that's just the truth. And they just, it just happens. It just it happens. But again, if we make it after, okay, I got to follow after their formula. You know, how, how many time, how many forty day fasts did they go through? How many, you know, things did they break off their lives and, and, and attain to? And how many? How, how can I get their pattern? How can I follow their prayer life? How can I, you know, okay, maybe they stayed in the prayer closet for twelve hours, and um, you know, that's where they got their anointing. So let me do that. I'm telling you, that will wear the heck out of you. <laughs> That just struck a thought and it may not be relevant. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the, script, the, the part of the scripture that talks about the different gifts that are given to the church, you're saying that basically it's the revelation of the gifts of healing, the gifts of speaking in tongues, the gifts of interpreting tongues, those the various the various yeah. gifts. So, so they're not really like specifically giving gifts to the individual as much as as it's a revelation of what that individual can accomplish through Christ. Yeah, so um, it. yeah. I, I think I think you are reading into it a little bit, um, but it is a good point. So I'll, I'll address that. So the, I think again, that's a separate issue. Okay. Um, I'm talking again more of the broad spectrum of the ability for us to walk in miracles and power, and everybody can do that. Um, everybody can can walk in, even though it talks about a person with a gift of miracles or the gift of healing or the gift of tongues. Yeah, there's a certain gifting that you might walk in. That's a gift. And that's something that you specialize in. Right. But every Christian we know, you know, has been allotted the spirit, the fullness of the spirit, and we can all move in all that stuff. So Paul says, he's like, I want all to prophesy. I want all, you know. So I'm talking about the general faith that everybody has. And so the people that are that you see miracles and all this kind of stuff for, when I say gift, I just mean the gift of revelation. Like they just they just have the revelation by God that they can they can do all things through Christ. Like it's just, it's just truth. It's not something they reached and climbed their way into. It's like their eyes were just open to a present reality. You know, it's like the chair has always been here all along, but when the lights go on, you realize it, and you can finally just sit down and re you know and rest in it. You know, it's this, it's kind of the lights going on. But the gifts issue—that's a whole other separate. Yeah, does that clarify? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other thought on this, sir? question why don't you like feel faith all the time why don't you feel faith what do you mean by feel faith like uh, I don't know like when something goes bad and you should have faith or like you should have the faith of God in you or something like that you don't like mm -hmm. it's not you're not feeling like everything's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, you don't feel at ease. You don't yeah. feel God's, like, you know, you don't feel God in you. You feel worried or panicked or something. Yeah. So, again, I mean, w as you're explaining it to me, I I'm seeing more of the train of thought, which, again, makes it more about yourself, more about your mm -hmm. faith to believe that things are going to work out. So, again, you're putting the focus back on yourself instead of on the Word, on, on God. So, um... I would say that the reason we don't always feel it is because we do get self-introspective and we do we lose sight of the truth that's always there all along, you know, or we're trying really hard, you know. We're we're try, we're, we're we're on the arms of God, we're on the shoulders of God, but we're we're so focused on all these other things going on and we're trying to have that faith in us. I think that's like it, it says it in Galatians 3 that the works everybody under the works of the law and the law speaks of your human effort are under a curse. So the more you're trying sometimes to be faithful, sometimes that does the exact opposite effect. You know, when, you, when you're trying to be holy, we all know the way the law works. It actually works against you. So if you're trying, you know, Paul talks about in Romans 7, the person who's still under the law, he was trying not to covet, not to, you know, be jealous over other people's property. And that was producing all kinds of coveting in his life because he was trying. It was about his own effort to be holy. So the same thing about you with faith, or any of us here, that it's we're trying to be 
to feel it. We're trying to believe it. We're trying to like, you know, be the one at peace. But sometimes it's 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 a letting go and it's a realizing that this is true regardless, you know. And and you go through clouds, you know, even while you're on dad's shoulder, you know, you go you go through clouds and you don't you forget the truth. I think that's I think that's part of it. It's still true, but you're not seeing, you know, you're not seeing the fullness of it. Of the verse, um, looking unto Jesus, the author yes. and finisher of our faith. Author and finisher, too. I mm. like that part also. I like the looking unto Jesus is awesome because you're looking away from yourself onto Jesus. That's mm -hmm. great, but I like how it also says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. I feel like you just proved the message mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. He's the author and the finisher. This, this scripture hit me, and I am convinced and sure that this very thing that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing to full completion in you. Mm. Whose work is it? Yeah. We take that on a lot of times. <laughs> I we, know. We, we interpret that, that I we got to do all that. Yeah. that. He says, he who began a good work in you, which is the Lord, so mm. it's his job, not mm. ours. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. That's really good. That's cool. You see the lights going off right now with scripture. Yeah. Like all these scriptures are coming to us. Like this message is affirmed by the Bible all over the place. Yeah. It really is. Like Hebrews eleven that talks about all the all the faith heroes, right? Mm -hmm. In verse twenty three, it says, "By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents." Like. Moses as a little kid mustered that up and had that happen like that wasn't that wasn't his effort you know but it's by faith Moses was hit three months by his parents Hebrews 11 23 or by faith the walls of Jericho fell the people marched around I, I think a lot of the message of Hebrews 11 it's really pointing to the finished work of Christ again faith is a message and you see that in Scripture. If you start reading the New Testament through this lens, you'll see that over and over again, that he talks about those who are of the faith or in the faith, meaning that faith is the message of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Faith is a truth. It's, it's a message. It's the faithfulness of God in Jesus. So that's another thing that might help as you read through stuff in, in Scripture. So I just turned, <laughs> I'm just going off the cuff here. Um, the Spirit clearly says in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That's 1 Timothy 4. Um, we've all, a lot of us have heard that before. In the latter times, some will abandon the faith and they'll follow after doctrines of demons. He's talking there very clearly about abandoning the message of Christ and his finished work and following deceptive teachings. It's very clear there. They'll abandon the faith. And they'll follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Things that aren't true. They'll, they'll mix it in. So they'll abandon the faith. The faith is just the simple truth of what Jesus has done. So when you read that word faith in scripture, that's most of the time that's what it's, it's really what it's talking about there. It's, it's, so it really, again, it puts our eyes off of ourselves onto Jesus, onto who he is. See this? Yeah. I'd say in the, like the last few years, uh -huh. um, it came through hearing messages about it, uh -huh. and I like there's a, there's a one uh, one author, amazing pastor named C. Baxter Kruger, who wrote um, who wrote about this dichotomy between faith in God and faith of God, mm -hmm. and and he really pointed out how there's an overwhelming amount of scholars and theologians that believe that it's really was supposed to be the faith of God. And there's a huge argument. If you go on Google and type this out, you'll get tons of people arguing against this and telling you, no, it's about faith in God. It's not God's faith. You know, they'll, they'll fight this tooth and nail. Um, so he was one person that I'd read and some other people that I was hearing kind of challenge my thinking about this. Um, and, uh, and so that's, I think that's really what, what started to open it up. And then as I started to read in Galatians, um, 
especially chapter three, that's where it really hit me. That's where I started to feel it inside, like this load coming off where I was like, wow, this is not about me. It's, it's, it's all him. He's done it. And that, um, that's what spurred me on to, you know, really follow mm-hmm. through with it. There's a verse in, I think it's in Hebrews, um, God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his promise. His oath, yeah. Uh, that's always been an enigma to me. Yeah. I, I don't know where that is. Yeah, that's, that's in Hebrews, uh, I think, chapter 4 or 5. Um, that's another beautiful example of this reality that it's all about an oath. It's all about God's oath and his promise. So it's what God promised to do. It's, it's on him. It's not on us. So, again, it's really meant to set... The writer of Hebrews was trying to set people free. That God wants us to know that he made a promise about this. It's on him. He made the oath. He's going to follow through with it. So when, he, when, when, when the author of Hebrews goes on to say, so don't fall away from the faith, don't lose the faith, okay, he's not talking about the Christians, okay, losing their own ability to somehow trust in that reality and, and be at a certain spiritual plateau where you believe in that stuff. He's simply saying don't go back to Jewish legalism that denies God's promise through Abraham, that denies that he said it, he did it in the blood of Jesus did it. Don't go back to the law and trying to earn God because that you're just blatantly denying the faith. Because that's what some of these people were doing in the book of Hebrews. They were going back to um, they were going back to sacrifices. They are going back to Jewish customs and eating certain foods and not eating certain foods. Yeah. So he's saying you're, you're, you're missing the point. Don't fall away from the faith. Don't fall away from the message that God made an oath and a promise that he would forgive you through the blood of Jesus, that he would cleanse you of all sin, that he would give you his Holy Spirit. All of that is God's promise. It has nothing to do with you, so stop putting it back on yourself. Mm-hmm. So you go back into the law. Yeah. Rather yeah. than grace. Yep. It's going back into law, and it's going back to this idea that you just somehow like conjure up God's favor instead of just knowing that you have that. Yeah. 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 It's actually Hebrews six. Let me let me read it. I love the spontaneity spontaneity in this because Mm -hmm. the Lord, I think He's just showing us in His Word. Uh, In in Hebrews six verse thirteen. Um, it says, "For when God made the promise to Abraham." Since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having waited patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Then he goes to break this down. He says, For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation to end every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, he interposed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, the promise and the oath, I just wanted to read how another translation put that, what the two unchangeable things are, the promise that he made and the oath that he followed it up on, in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope that is sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. And then he goes to break down what Jesus did as the high priest in our full salvation. But again, if you read Hebrews through the old lens, through the faith in God lens, you read about like, okay, Abraham and what he did with Isaac. We have the tendency to make that about us. So in order to get God's promise, we need to sacrifice something we love. And how many of us have heard sermons about that? Like, if you want the promise, you have to be willing to sacrifice the thing that God has given you. You know, we've heard that, right? Many times. Puts it all back on us.
that's a that's a whole other topic. Yeah, yeah that's you're going. Sac- yeah, sacrificing. See, sacrificing money is a totally different issue mm-hmm. because money, like the because of the principle of sowing and reaping. When you sow financially and you give towards people and things, you are releasing something in the in the atmosphere around your life. You are reaping blessing in your life through the act of sowing. That's a totally different concept. And the rich entering into heaven, that's a whole other issue. He's talking about not holding on to earthly treasures and people that worship and idolize those things. That's a, that's a totally different issue. But, but I can apply it by just the fact that, like you said, you put on yourself well, what about this area that's not totally surrendered? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because again, we put the surrender on us, we put the work on us, we need to surrender, we need to sacrifice. And the story of Abraham and Isaac is not about us, it's about God and Jesus. That's what it's about. It's about the message of Christ. It's about what Christ did for us and trusting in that reality. That's what it's about. When you get that revelation, listen, when you get that revelation, You'll want to sacrifice everything. You know what I mean? It, that will be the natural fruit. You will want to give away. You will want to surrender things to God, but it's no longer about your work. It's about the natural fruit of your life because you found rest in Jesus. See the difference there? Very subtle, but very powerful. The one wants you to make it all, wants to focus on you need to surrender. You need to do this to get your breakthrough. You need to give up what you treasure the most, and then God will bless you. They put the cart before the horse. That's not how it works. The story of Abraham and Isaac is about Jesus Christ gave his life. God sacrificed his son and even told Abraham not to do it with Isaac because that was not the Lamb of God. Jesus was the Lamb of God. That story is about Jesus. It's not about us. And as we rest in Jesus, we find our joy in Jesus, then it's going to be easy. Not only that, I mean, that wasn't Abraham saying, oh, I'm going to sacrifice my son. God asked him to. God also gave him the faith to do it. Yeah, he did. It says in the New Testament... He knew God could raise him from the dead. He knew he was a promised child. So when he went up there, he wasn't thinking, I'm sacrificing. I mean, he just had this faith from God, and God asked him to do it. Yeah. It wasn't like he conjured up, I'm going to do this for God. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Plus, he really trusted God. Yeah. He trusted in the goodness of God. Yeah. I mean, it says that in Hebrews. Yeah. I mean, that was from his experience with God. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard joy to have. To walk up there and just be knowing, like, you know, God. Well, actually, no, no, it's easy when you know. Yeah, yeah. he knew God. When you know. know. He knew yeah, God could raise him from the dead. He was like, you know, he didn't he expect it. He said, I'm going to walk away today. He was, he knew, and that's faith, too, from, you know, God gave him that faith, right? Yeah. yeah. Look at all the experiences he, I love because he has so much in his life. He had so many experiences with God by the time he got to that one. He was like, okay, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can trust you. He would have had to have to. Imagine if it was a new experience. Oh, right. going crazy. Oh, well, you look at his <laughs> earlier right. life. You look at his earlier life, and it says, like, when he left his homeland, um, I forget how the scripture says it exactly, but it's like he had thought about it for a long time before he'd done it. Yeah, like, he God did. Had Abraham asked did him. not obey right God away. God had asked him a long, yeah. long time ago, and now he's going, okay, I'm going to step out in this. Yeah. He said, <laughs> leave, leave, God said to him, leave your father's household and go to the land I tell you instead he brought his dad with him and settled in a place called Haran and didn't even go to Canaan where he was supposed to go and then he waited for his dad to die who knows how many years that was and then he finally went after that and so the whole point of the book of Genesis I'm telling you when you read about these screwballs in the in the story I mean they're all like us (laughs) it all gives us hope to say listen it wasn't about these guys it was about God's faithfulness. Yeah, he lied it was about his, his promise. And, By the way, this is an aside. But Abraham was extremely wealthy. Yeah. Extremely wealthy. Yeah. As most of God's people, and it talks about in the Bible, King David, Solomon, the wealthiest. So it's not the money that's the root of all evil. It's the love and worship of the money that's yeah. the root of all evil. Yeah. You can have money and be... Uh, yeah, is the, did the air shut off? No, it's just so hot out. Yeah, somebody might have turned it down. Well, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna finish up yeah. here in a second. Well, <laughs> yeah. And the other thing too about Isaac, like him and Sarah didn't have this child forever, and when they finally had this child, she was barren. I mean, she was past menopause. 
Right. So I mean, like he's already seen that God has risen this child out of his wife, who was inca- they were incapable. So yeah. By the time he's woke up that mountain, he's like, "Oh, God can raise him from the dead." I'm so, so let me wrap this up. Thank. That's really good, cool, right? Let let me wrap this up with saying again with Second Peter, when he says, "Those who've received a faith of the same value as ours," meaning that faith is equal for everybody. Again, it's this message of truth. What Jesus has done. I just want to leave you with this understanding that you don't need to look at other people in church history or people around you and say that they're at some greater plateau than you and get this inferiority complex about your faith and your present state with God and compare yourself to them because the fruit of that is just horrible when you're comparing yourself to other people and you're beating yourself up because you're not at that person's level. And you live in that inferiority complex, and you just and it just breeds negativity. It breeds self introspection, breeds low self esteem, and all these bad buzzwords. Right? It's just not good. So we need to let that go and realize that that person, that great apostle Peter, just like he said here, he doesn't have anything more than you do. He's not any more special than you are. Peter, and he had a great advantage at this because he saw the resurrected Jesus. Peter just realized the message of truth that was true for him and every single one of us. He just opened his eyes. He just said yes to it. Again, it's a revelation. It's an understanding. It's true, regardless of if you believe it or not. That's the message of faith. (laughs) In a nutshell. This is really good dialogue, though. I love the questions. I love the rabbit trails and the scripture. Um, But really, get, get into the New Testament. Read it afresh from this understanding of faith because... Uh, it's really fun, and it's really relieving when you start to uh, when you start to see it. Read those scriptures that that, that bring you to that level, like you know, like you are seated in heavenly places, you know, the Lord. That you are a royal priesthood. I, I used to love like when we had our life group, just speaking them and reading them over the people. Yeah. Because we used to be, you know, well, still is, I guess, but where if you raised your if you ask the group of Christians who's a sinner everyone would raise their hand if you ask them who's a saint you might not get that many hands but it says we're all saints yeah so we've got to remember That's go ahead the Lord says about us go ahead um, I just heard something on uh, crossing the goal I don't know if everybody would watch that it's a Catholic actually uh huh but they have some cool stuff that the little guy Peter heard back Mm-hmm. You know, he was just being awakened to, you know, the born again experience. They don't use this term because it's Catholic, but. Yeah. And he said he was fighting. He was in the stadium at Notre Dame with like 30, I don't think it was like 30,000 people. And he said, oh, but I don't have this faith. Oh, I don't think I can give up this. Yeah, I don't think I can live this way. He was like really battling in his mind. And, um, this man in, in uh, behind him came up to him um, and said, you know, the Lord gave him the best word, basically. He said, the Lord showed me that um, he's going to give you all the faith, all the grace, all the love you need to, to walk this out. Wow. And he said that was such a breakthrough for him. He said that was it. That was the transformation because that was the struggle. The struggle was but I can't live up to this. Okay. Cool. Very cool. Father, thank you for this word on faith. Thank you for the freedom that it brings. Lord, I just pray you would continue to open up our eyes to the glory of the gospel, how good it really is, how good the flavor of faith really is when we realize that you really did it all, Jesus, that it's done, it's finished, it's accomplished. We're already seated on our Father's shoulders and we can relax in that knowledge. So, Lord, we just bless you. Bless the rest of this morning, this week. In Jesus' name we pray.